All right, everybody, welcome to the first episode of the Viper's Nest. It's your host, Moose, with the Sports Heap. And as always, we'll have Emrod on board as well as we get going with Viper's coverage about less than a month away from kickoff. Tonight, we'll talk about XFL rules and kind of general overview. We'll talk about the coaching staff and, and a little bit of an overview of the Vipers roster. We'll check in with some of Emrod's players to watch. And then, of course, we'll we'll take a look at the schedule, see where the Vipers will be in their 10-game schedule this year for the XFL season. As we always do here at the Sports Heap, Let's hit that intro. Everybody, hope you're having a great evening with your host, Moose. Let's bring him in, the co-host for the Viper's Nest. It's Emrod. Emrod, how's hey. it going? It's going pretty good. Glad I finally rocked my uh, Tampa Viper shirt. He's got the there. Viper shirt. We're ready for the Viper's Nest. Episode one of our podcast where we'll be covering uh, the Viper's season. Of course, we're getting ready about a month or so before... Uh, today we'll we'll focus on the offensive preview and then of course going over the rules that were just released the other day we're really excited to see some innovative thinking from the xfl leadership with some rules not sure if it's going to be adapted by the nfl anytime soon but i think it'll be entertaining at least we'll go through those bit by bit and kind of how we talked about the intro we'll look at our coaching staff We'll look at our offensive players, and then we'll take a look at the schedule as well. Ten-game season for the XFL. Hoping we can get through at least week six or week seven, wherever the AAF kind of fell off. I think uh, Vince McMahon's pockets are a little bit deeper. And honestly, I've been pretty impressed by the marketing push by the XFL as well. Uh, maybe you want to very clean, very uh, yeah, very professional, very different from what it was, you know, twenty years ago. Uh, no, he hate me. No, uh, no videos making fun of fair catches. Even though some of the punting rules that we'll talk about seem to really want to discourage fair catches and and punting in general or strategic punting in general. But we'll talk about that. Emrod, you're now a you're a co you're a, a ticket season ticket holder and founder. Talk about that experience and and what you're looking forward to as a ticket a season ticket holder. Yeah, I'm definitely pretty excited about that. I got some season tickets um, for the game, um, so I guess I can say that I'm a XFL Tampa Vipers season ticket founder since it's the first year and I am season ticket holder. So pretty excited about that. I mean, there's some benefits such as like um, um, season ticket holders slash unofficial founders um, get things such as like field pass for like a game, um, some extra events and stuff. So I'm really looking forward to that. Looking forward to being on the field, maybe perhaps even meeting some players, talking to them, um, talking to, you know, some of the coaches just to, that was good a vibe, um, as we know, you know, they're Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I had a uh, family member who worked for the Buccaneers, so I was able to actually go on the field during some um, some during um, training camp and actually talk to some players. It was a great experience, but I'm definitely looking forward to the Vipers, um, a whole new league. I hope that it definitely, um, you know, I paid for five games, home games. Hopefully, I get to go to all five, unlike the AAF, who some people got to go to two or three. <laughs> and I don't know if they offered any refunds or not. I highly doubt they did. But anyways, um, but yeah, pretty excited about the Vipers. I like I like the uniforms, I like the way they look. I like the some teams, some things on the team here that I like. Some players I'm pretty excited about. Look forward to discussing that. Um, but yeah, it's just um, you know, football season normally ends after Super Bowl, and we uh, we sit here and we wait all the way until like the draft or anything just to really get anything going. I mean, none of us normally have time to watch the combine or things like that. So the next 
time football picks up, I think it's exciting. It's a little bit more free agency, uh, but mainly when it gets down to the draft area. Um, and after the draft, you got your mini training camps and finally get into spring training. And for those who enjoy it, one of my shows that I love watching is Hard Knocks. So I look forward to that. But, you know, now there's no in between waiting. The season goes all the way up to what, like uh, May or close to May? Yeah, it's uh, probably so that- getting up there a little bit past the draft, which which is a nice nice bridge because I think we start getting back into football. The draft kind of gets as excited or or I guess if you have a bad draft, not as excited and then get a nice little summer off season where, you know, you may, if you're a baseball fan, you're kind of falling back into love with baseball a little bit even though it's a long summer. But as soon as that last week of July when training camp comes in, you're so excited for the or at least for the Buccaneer season but I'm truly excited for this experiment and again we, we talked about how clean the rollout has looked from the XFL a, a very well orchestrated uniform release where all the teams had like fan events that release uniforms like at, literally at the same time so it was really awesome to see the Twitter rolling out with all the teams like here are what the Roughnecks look like here are what the Guardians look like and here are what the Vipers look like so again yeah. Just night and day difference from what we experienced as we were teenagers growing up with the old XFL. And yeah. I think, you know, and this is something larger picture. I think culture has changed in the past 20 years where, you know, I think Vince McMahon and that was towards the end of the Attitude Era of WWE. You know, we were big WWE fans as we were growing up in middle school and a little bit into high school. And I mean, that was, we we really saw the end of the Attitude Era as they took over WCW and and whatnot. That was really the transition into where we're at now in WWE. And I think the XFL was a little bit of trying to capitalize on the Attitude Era and in your face. And uh, we're going to really, some like hyper machismo, I guess, is the way to describe what it used to be. But I'm really been impressed now with it's really toned down. It's legitimately trying to be a just, you know, a, a spring football league, which I think is great. No, it's definitely, definitely, there's definitely a market for it. A lot of football fans who are just sitting around, I mean, and waiting for football to start again, as you, I mean, you and myself are. Um, and it's not fans. even fans too, but there's, there's plenty of football players that love the game and, you know, maybe they don't have the talent to be in, in the yeah, NFL, NFL 32 and, you know, people love the game and, you know, these players are likely going to have a day job some, you know, during the off season, whether, you know, they went pro in something other than sports, as the NFC, the NCAA likes to say. But, you know, these are players that love the game. And when you love a game, you deserve to play that game, especially if it's something where you were successful in college. So I'm happy that we can get some fans in front of players like Aaron Murray and Quentin Flowers, who, you know, were homegrown talents here in Tampa. Aaron Murray having a successful career at Plant High School under Coach Wiener and moving on to Georgia, and then Quentin Flowers, of course, uh, having a great career with the USF Bulls. Yeah, and if they're playing in this, there's two reasons they're playing in it. It's because, A, they just love football, and they know they're not good enough to play in the NFL, or B, they feel they are good enough to play in the NFL, and this is a great way to Absolutely. be highlighted. Um, and they're definitely not playing for the money here, because this is not a million-dollar league. Um, so, I mean, you know, you have people, there, most of the people who are playing are passionate about the sport. That's why they're here. So that's another thing that makes it kind of exciting. Kind of like, you know, I would say, I mean, I mean, obviously we haven't seen the game yet or anything like that, but I would say this is kind of like that in between college and football. Because, you know, we, a lot of people love college football because they know people are playing with their hearts out every single play. Um, you know, some people love the NFL for what it is. Some people don't like the NFL because they feel like the players are, you know, not playing the hardest on every time. Mm-hmm. So this is kind of like that in between where, you do have them being paid, but yet at the same time, they're not getting paid um, like enough like they would be in the NFL. But B, they're here playing because they will love the game and they're going to play their hearts out every single time. So I'm pretty excited about that. And, so. and I think it's a step up, too, from the game. You know, I think the arena leagues face some troubles. And yeah. this is like the third iteration of whatever's left of the arena league. I think there's four teams left. You know, our beloved. The whole thing's. Folded, I think they shut down. Yeah, I, I think so. I think they came back, and that's why I'm saying third iteration. I think there's like four teams right now that play, uh, and we'll look into that. But you know, at least you have players that are able to play on a full football field, and you know, I think your Kurt Warners are very rare. Uh, you know, if you if you will. So I think this yeah. is a good place to showcase uh, players' skills. 
So before we get into the show, nope. might be it seized operations in 2019. It's got yeah. So it came back, and I guess now for sure it is six feet under. The rest in peace, Arena Football League. And another reason um, I think we're really more excited in this than we were before all the other leagues is. Uh, when the XFL first came out, the closest team was the Orlando Rage. So it wasn't really here in Tampa Bay. And then we had um, the Tampa Bay Storm, which was a pretty successful team. I remember going to the Arena Football Championship League as a child, and they won. It was actually a lot of fun going to those games. Very intense, very quick. And then um, the AAF came, and the closest team again was the Orlando Rage. Um, and for those that... Or the know, Apollos, yeah, the, the Orlando Apollos. Yeah, the Orlando Apollos, right, sorry. Uh, for those of us, you know, who don't follow us on other shows, just so you know, um, I'm Mike. I'm actually here in Tampa Bay area. And uh, Moose, who's actually from the Tampa Bay area, born and raised, actually lives in Austin, Texas. But he's still very passionate about his Tampa Bay sports team. So the Vipers being part of the Tampa Bay um, area and being part of Tampa Bay and representing Tampa Bay actually makes it where we're actually more excited than we would have been if this – there was no team in, in Tampa Bay, so right, and, a little bit more exciting for us. And just like the AF coming on board last year, you know, we were like, oh, "All right, we'll we'll give this a shot," you know. And when we first started our initial podcast, you know, 1.0 a year ago or so, you know, we talked about the AF a little bit, but yeah, we weren't really excited because we didn't have any ties. I mean, San Antonio had a team, and you know, I never made it down to San Antonio to to see the Commanders and. You know, you didn't get to get a chance to go see the Apollos because it's a little bit of a drive. But I, I really like I like the idea of putting teams in in markets that have NFL teams because it keeps that interest going. And and we it's a proven fan base, right? You're not going to San Antonio, which it was a novelty for most of these markets. And mm-hmm. that, I think that's part of the reason it wasn't it wasn't successful. It was like, oh, cool, we have a team. Oh, it's not the NFL and well, we got better things to do in Orlando, like go to Disney or go see the go see OC or, or Orlando City or, or whatnot. And I think pretty much every city that has an NFL team has uh, that has an XFL team has an NFL team as well. The only one that does not want to say is maybe St. Louis, the yep. Battle Hawks there. Yeah, um, they had one about a couple years ago, um, but they don't have one now. So I say that's the only team that doesn't have an active NFL team in there that I can think of. Yeah, great point. Yeah, I forgot about that. Kind of exploring the St. Louis market again. Before we get going in to our topics for the day, kind of, I know Mike or Emrad uh, introduced us a little bit. Want to talk to you, especially if you're a first time listener to uh, the Sports Heap network of shows. Just let you know what we have and where you can find us. We're always live on YouTube. Uh, we either do a pre recorded show, so you can find us on our channel at the sports heap on youtube we go live every once in a while we'll do a live show uh, so you can find us there if you like watching us live and interact with us on comment via comments we also have a few other shows under our umbrella uh, that i'm going to put up on the screen now if you're watching on youtube and i'll try my best to introduce these if you're listening so you know what's going on of course you're listening to the viper's nest right now and an an, an xfl oriented show covering the tampa bay vipers and the xfl our one of our big anchor shows is the bucking hangover which is a buccaneers reaction show again we have our episodes archived on youtube if you want to watch our pre-recorded shows and we have those available as well on podcasting platforms like apple google and spotify we have the ten dollar sports show, which is our amateur sports gambling advice. Just recorded an episode for NFL divisional weekend. So if you're into amateur sports betting, give us a, a you can check that out. You can always follow us on Twitter as well. You'll see our Twitter handle our Twitter Twitter handles below. What's a twiddle? Uh, yeah, what's I don't know what a twiddle is. A Twitter handles below us. That's at moose underscore tsh and at mrod underscore tsh we have the thunderdome podcast which is tampa lightning focus show it's my solo project i'm usually up uploading episodes every saturday or sunday now that I, i took a few weeks off of that one but we're back the bolts are back a big four nothing shutout victory against the coyotes today nine wins in a row and then of course we have our live show balls brews and bros that we do on youtube we usually do that about once a month we'll talk about 
sports topics and non-sports topics as well. We'll probably have an episode of that coming up later in January. And we must be drinking during that show, too. That's right. We we have our Balls, Brews, and Bros official mugs that we must drink out of. And we'll, we'll talk about everything. We'll get some basketball going, some hockey going, and uh, probably some off-topic stuff. I got a wedding to plan. Uh, I, I'd love to go on a rant on how ridiculous weddings are in 2020. And then also... Uh, we always love talking about movies and what we've seen in our favorite guilty pleasure shows. This is us is coming back next week, by the way, if you're a listener of that, then also on the screen, you'll see kind of our personas. The sports heap again is our network of shows. We're always expanding. We've got five shows. Now we're in the works of getting another show with a couple friends going as well. And we got the logo for the sports moose, which is me. You'll see that on Twitter. We're working on Emrod's uh, custom logo, I know we got to get the fedora going for Emrod. We, we have to have a fedora type logo and uh, we'll get that uploaded in our lovely Miami vice color. So that's the sports heap in a few short minutes of explanation, but let's get back to what you're here for Tampa Bay Vipers news. Let's get going with our first topic of the day. And again, we went over where you can find us on podcast. You'll see if you're watching the screen, of course, live shows on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. You should be able to download download those any day now. Topics for versus- Vipers Nest. Will this Vipers Nest be on those podcast platforms? It will be. Should be in there in the next week. So we're recording. Okay. We're recording now, July or uh, January 9th. I had expected to be set by the end of the weekend. I'm gonna get all that going. Uh, by the weekend so first episode should drop on your platforms by sunday hopefully or monday you can always watch us live on youtube if you want to get the scoop beforehand that should be uploaded by tomorrow morning topics are up on the board we're gonna go over the xfl overview and and the rules which are really interesting we're gonna look at our coaching roster as well as kind of a a 10,000 foot view of our roster really going to focus on the offense today and a few players to watch going to look at that 2020 schedule and Emrod who again is our founder and season ticket holder really going to drill down yeah he's really excited going to drill down on the players that he's most excited to watch again Emrod's really our expert on the Vipers right now uh, as I get up to speed, so I'm gonna let him shine on these first few episodes, uh, especially since I'm not in Tampa and I can't share in the excitement. Uh, but I, I know Emrod's been doing some great analysis and is excited for a few of our key, key our key position players. So as we look at the overview, I'll probably jump over to our second screen. Uh, most of you, if you're listening to the podcast, you probably are excited for the xfl and know what's going on uh wanted to look at our teams right see the week one matchups coming up after that weekend after the super bowl really excited for the markets that they picked the uh, really diverse i think team uh areas that love football though la is in la is an interesting choice i think that was mostly done for tv marketing reasons uh the rams are getting some love you know, the Chargers are a different story. Seattle's, I think, always a solid market. They'll be playing the DC Defenders, LA, the Wildcats, and the Roughnecks from Houston. Tampa's going up to New York to play the Guardians. And then, of course, the only market without an NFL team, the St. Louis Battlehawks, going against the Dallas Renegades. I love the Renegades logo there. So those yeah, are your- definitely. Those are your teams for season one, at least, of the XFL. Hopefully there'll be some expansion going on. What, what about that uh, the Roughneck logo? They try to like kind of use the Oilers type of love it. type of thing there. Yeah, I love the, the Roughnecks logo, actually. Their uniforms are okay. Logo's great. Kind of going for that Houston Oilers vibe, but kind of using the Texans colors, which... I thought was interesting. It seemed like most of these teams went away from what the colors were in their, their current NFL cities or their current NFL teams. 
Roughnecks were not shy about uh, kind of going after that red, white, and blue hey, of man, the Texans. The Vipers went after the Rowdies colors. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, you Rowdies. The Vipers going with the, the Rowdies colors. I, I don't know. What logo do you like? I think I think one of my – a lot of people didn't like the Guardians logo. I actually kind of like the Guardians logo. I, I don't know why. I think it's it's an interesting shade of gray with the, you know, the lion kind of – coming through it Uh, my favorite one honestly is probably the dallas i really do like dallas's logo for some reason it's kind of i guess it takes me a little bit back to tambay bandits a little bit oh i like that yeah it does look like the bandits which i was really hoping that i mean i don't know if they were up for grabs or whatnot but i was really hoping for tambay bandits um for the xfl but uh i was actually pretty shocked with the vipers if you would have told me the vipers i would never guess that in a million years so um, but you know, our logo logo is okay. Um, it's not too bad. I like the way they kind of use the beat to look like the eye at the same you know, time. Let's be honest. It's I'd rate it at number eight over the eight logos. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I would. Let's be honest. I mean, it. Yeah. I, I'd I, probably I, say seven. The LA one's kind of boring. Yeah. Uh, we'll put it at seven. I kind of wish they went with the snake's head. Yeah, uh, kind of like. like I like, I like my, 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 my shirt. Exactly. I, I like that logo. I, I wish they went with that one. You know, I guess they were going to V for Vipers. You know, V's a pretty powerful letter. So I, I can see that and I see the fangs and, and what. Yeah, I mean, so. it's like the eye. I, I could see the eye a little bit like a snake's eye there in the dead center of it. Um, but I think the, the logo that I have on my shirt, that snake, I think that's going to be on the jerseys right in the center. It's right. going to be like where the XFL patches on most teams. We're going to have a, a snake there. Um, so I mean, what do you think about the colors for the Vipers? I I I like that they're unique. Uh, like we we're saying, I, I like that they went away from what the standard colors were for most teams. So it's it's really differentiating. You know, I'm glad they didn't go you know red and pewter or red uh, or any, even blue because uh, Lightning and the Rays kind of mm-hmm. own blue. blue so I think green is good to set their own identity. Same thing with the Guardians. They kind of own that gray and red. Yeah, I like the Defenders. Anything with li- I mean, bias because I love the Lightning, but anything with with bolts, I'm a big fan of. So I think the Defenders look great in their r- red and red and white. Yeah, not for sure. So let's go over the rules quickly, and we'll use the official XFL website to to break down the rules. I think. Uh, the kickoff, I think, is really going to look interesting. The video does a pretty good job at showing, uh, in case you haven't heard of the rules, of what it looks like. But essentially, everyone's going to be lined up on the other side of the field. The kicker is still going to kick the ball. And then they can't really attack each other until the person e- either A, catches the ball, or B, the, the it's been three seconds. So you're looking at a five-yard range of engagement, which is good. So you don't have a 260-pound man running, sprinting 40 yards and running into someone who's basically at zero speed. Because if you've seen return coverage, they're usually running back to make sure that the ball is not going to be kicked to the 20-yard line. Then they're turning around and then engaging. NFL's done a great job to make it as safe as possible, uh, you know, eliminating... Eliminating... I guess uh, Emrods was looking at the video. Uh, yeah. Uh, NFL's done a great job at trying to eliminate the you know two or three man walls that used to form. So I think this is definitely a safer way to handle that. And no running start either. Yeah, like no, you were saying, no which I think start. it's huge because like you were saying, like someone coming full speed a collision. So yeah. I wonder if it makes. I wonder if that actually the way it's set up, if that's going to make it harder to return a kick, or are we going to have more kick returns? Because it does give. I mean, because you can't really move until the guy catches the ball. So, I mean, it's a, if you're a good blocker, you're going to have more of an opportunity. Because if you think about it, um, I'm just thinking about like as a quarterback. You know, you really can't blitz quarterback until the ball has been snapped. So it's kind of like, hey, you can't really go after the guy, the receiver, until the ball has been caught. So, I mean, does it give more? Of strategy kind of more like a, I guess it's more of a play instead of just catching and running it you know what I'm saying and I, and I think what speaks to that is they now have a what they've determined a major touchback and a minor touchback so major touchback if the ball is kicked into the end zone and downed in the 
end zone. It's a major touchback, and you get the ball at the 35. Versus a minor touchback. Uh, ball bounces inbounds and then out of the end zone or is downed in the end zone. Ball's placed on the return side, 15 yard line. So that's really, I guess they're tr trying to minimize returns and just have the offense start at, thir at the 35 most times. I mean, mm -hmm. most kickers nowadays just are, I mean, with the kickoffs happening from the 35 or able to get it into the end zone if not through the end zone yeah so it seems like again kind of like the nfl has been slowly conditioning us to get just be frustrated with kickoffs because returns are never almost never happening i mean realistically i mean you and i watch a lot of football you know, especially using especially yourself using red zone you get to watch the game um you know not saying that i mean obviously very dangerous sport but i mean how often do you see players get injured on kickoffs anymore um you know i don't see it too often where the oh it's on the uh, the kickoff stop the clock players injured mm -hmm. don't see it as often as like as you would think it would be but um but i think this is definitely definitely a way to make it a little bit safer and i wouldn't be surprised the nfl adopted it considering that they adopted a few things from the original xfl right uh, so i'm curious to see how many things the nfl adopt from this era of the xfl a few years later I think here is interesting. You can still do onside kicks. I really would have liked to see the AAF rule. I, I like the fourth and fifteen, uh, but they're going to allow traditional onside kicks, but no surprise onside kicks. So Sean Payton uh, may not be happy here, or the Atlanta Falcons this year, for that matter. Mm. I like the point after touchdown. You get uh, eliminating extra point kicks, which I'm okay with get to go for one two or three kind of like flag football uh one starts at the two yard line like usual well i guess your usual two point conversion two points starts at the five or a three point conversion from the 10 yard line so kind of interesting some of the feedback and some of the thoughts i had that i hope this isn't this doesn't turn into madden where teams are spamming uh, slants and it's an easy two <laughs> points every time. So yeah, that's true. That, uh, um, another question here um, for you. So um, team scores a touchdown, you can go for one, two, or three, obviously. And I know uh, we discussed earlier before the show that about the continuous clock. Does the continuous clock still run after a touchdown? Uh, I'd expect not. I, I think these are untimed downs. Uh, so I think point after touchdown are, are untimed downs. So I'd expect okay. the clock to run after uh, to stop after a touchdown. Okay. But I think if it's normal plays of scrimmage, it should be running. I might be wrong there. That's actually a great question. As a founder, you should contact your season ticket rep and get clarification on that for us. I should. <laughs> well, I like this, though, that if you're if the defense causes a turnover, you get the same number of points as the team uh, of what we're going for. So if you get a, if you get a Jameis Winston pick six on a three-point conversion, you're the team that actually gets the three points. I kind of like that. Let's see. Punts. Punts is really, and I made a comment to you, is kind of makes me a little sad because it seems like they were discouraging the, the coffin corner type of punting and the strategy that comes with punting. Uh, basic, uh, I like that you can't leave the line after until the kick, the, the, the ball passes the line of scrimmage. I like that. Then, uh, again, the same thing with the gunners. They have to stay at the line until the punt leaves. However, oh, hold up. Defenders of the gunner cannot cross the line. That's fine. So again, if it goes out of bounds, it's a major touchback. Anyway, anywhere inside the 35. Yeah, that's that's the rule I was telling you about that. Basically, if you do a coffin corner anywhere inside the 35, the ball comes out to the 35 anyway. Mm. And then fair catches are permitted. They are permitted. Well, the ball comes out of bounds prior to 35, it'll come to where it's uh, not. Yeah, before 35, it'll go to where it went out of bounds. So 35 is like the minimum start line. Right. So, I mean, I think the rationale here is it's supposed to incentivize the team to go for it on fourth down. I think some of the feedback was, oh, well, you know, the NFL has too many punts and it's just back and forth, which, you know, I, I think if you're a hardcore NFL fan, you appreciate the small nuances of the game and punting is just part of the game. But 
you know, as our as culture kind of shifts and everyone loves offense, and I think you would could definitely argue that the XFL is a very offense friendly league. Mm-hmm. You know, they're trying to minimize punting by making the penalty for going for it on fourth down minimal because you know if you're punting on fourth down the other team's going to start on the 35 anyway so you know if you're well within range what's what's another 10 or 15 yards yeah definitely because right now in the nfl i mean pretty it'd be fourth and half and they're punting pretty much in every fourth down so this definitely um definitely doesn't make it a little more exciting uh, but like you said hopefully it doesn't turn into madden <laughs> so here's the the rule that we were really interested in this double forward pass. And I know you're going to preview a few of our skill players that we have on offense that really could take advantage of this. We've got a, I think the Vipers did a good job in their skill player portion of the draft. I, I'm very curious about this. I think the when we first heard this, like, Oh my gosh, you can you do a double pass from anywhere, but kind of like what we thought, it's going to be actually is going to be behind the line of scrimmage. So if you remember in the NFL, you can throw a double pass. If your first pass is a lateral or a backwards pass here, it might be interesting to run stuff out of shotgun where you can actually throw a forward bubble screen, if you will. And if you have the appropriate blocking set up, you can actually throw it again. So I'm really curious to see what that does for the playbook. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think it definitely, um, you know, lets you um, utilize, definitely opens the playbook a little bit more. And, um, you know, someone like um, Mark Tresman, who, you know, usually runs unconventional plays here, um, could use, like, some plays where, you know, Murray tucked up to a running back. Running back kind of, like, takes a step or two. Um, like, if he's going to run but then stops and throws it, as long as it's behind the line of scrimmage, it's good to go. So pretty excited to see what kind of plays it dare draw up here. Um, like, you know, not to get too far into it right now, but Quint Flowers, a running back slash quarterback mm. who can, yeah. um, who, who could be a very dangerous weapon, uh, double four passes, something like this. So definitely pretty excited to about him. And, you know, we'll definitely get, um, get more into that here, um, shortly as we go over the, after we get over the rules. And I wonder if we can get even creative on screen passes. Cause if you're able to complete it under behind the line of scrimmage, you got to two or three offensive linemen in front of you and if the screen's not going to pan out or, you, or there's pressure there maybe that's an opportunity to even throw the ball the ball forward again as long as you're catching the ball behind the line of scrimmage so yeah like i said like you said i'm excited to see what tressman and our offensive coordinator have uh get to draw up with the double pass rule overtime i think is really interesting they're kind of going to a shootout uh NHL style shootout or I guess MLS type shootout where you get a possession that starts at the five yard line. You have one play to get it in the end zone. So whoever scores the most and you get two points for each, essentially it's like two point conversions. Uh, if you remember uh, just a few seconds ago, we were talking about the conversions. So best of five on the two point conversion plays is the winner. And I think they're not going to play him out. So kind of like the soccer shootout, if there's no way that you can make up the score, then they'll end the sh- the uh, the overtime period. No scoring for the defense if there's a pick six. Ooh, it looks like a, I really like that if there's a defensive penalty, it actually moves up to the one-yard line. So it's not even half the distance to the goal. You're moving from the five to the one. And then... Uh, I like the pre-snap penalty. Yeah, post-snap penalty. Yeah, no score. I like that. So, big fan of the overtime. I I don't know. I, I still do like the college-style overtime. Uh, let them start from the 25 and see if they can drive it in, kick a field goal. Then after that, uh, third overtime. I kind of like this little shootout type of like ho- hockey-slash-soccer type of vibe. You know, you see him get you know, five opportunities. Um, I don't know. I think it's going to be interesting. It's going to be fun to watch. Because, I mean, if you failed on one play and, you know, you still got four other chances. So, um, so I think it'll be pretty cool. I think this is one that I was talking about that kind of, kind of crazy me a 25 second play clock. Well, the play clock and, and I think some of the changes come to the XFL trying to make games shorter. And I, I wanted to 
I mean, NFL games take so long. A lot of that is commercials. But I mean, you and I went to a Notre Dame game together, and we had we had the timekeeper man. You remember the money maker? The, the money maker, like the the official with the orange uh, mitts, who was the TV timeout guy. And I mean, <laughs> I think that Notre Dame USF game was a crazy experience, uh, regardless. But even if without the weather, I mean. I've been to Notre Dame games. Those are four-hour games. Like, it's crazy. So I'm, I'm really excited for this, trying to shoot for under three hours, uh, kind of taking a, a soccer-type approach with a mostly running clock. I'm going to let you talk about the 25-second pl- play clock because I think you had a, a really interesting perspective when we were prepping for the show. No, I was saying we got a 25-seconds play clock here. Right now in the NFL, it's about 40 um, you know, if you, you know those of who watch the NFL and are pretty, um, you know, pretty big fans of it, you watch the games and you usually see by the time the players call the snap, um, there's normally like three or less seconds on it. Most of them are like calling it as like the one second is going to zero, barely gaining it out. Um, so this 15 seconds, I think, it's going to be huge. You almost got to go to the line, kind of like knowing <laughs> what your next like four plays are going to be. Um, um, going into there so I mean but there is also like uh, like some communication in the helmet so offensive, offensive players um, was it all of them or I think they like... all get that I, I think they specify that as we get to the end of the rules but yeah I think all offensive players have speak have uh, speakers and only one defensive player so again just speaking to how this is an offense centric league yeah so um so, yeah, so, I mean, I guess that would help being able to communicate things. So, I guess they won't have to huddle up as much. And, I mean, with the 25 seconds, there might be, like, a lot of no huddle plays, too. Think of it now. Yeah, that's uh, a great point that if everyone's on the same page and they know the play, there's no reason to huddle. You're getting it from the coach. Yeah, no doubt. So, uh, so let's move on. Um, yeah, what they're calling the comeback period. Running clock outside of two minutes in each half. Pretty self-explanatory. Uh yeah, five seconds to run off the play clock. So, uh, basically, running running clock uh, except for outside the two minute warning in each half. So that should help speed up games a little bit. Uh, we talked about the running play clock, timeouts instead of the standard three, you only get two per half. And then replay, I think, is what's really going to be interesting. No challenges. Everything that comes up from the field from the booth, kind of like college to. A degree most of the challenges if not all now in college actually come from the view from above for additional viewing and they're going to have a replay official a little bit like the aaf who's the one actually making the review the not the the referee isn't going to walk to a box and we're going to listen to a photograph by def leopard like we usually do at raymond james stadium for five minutes <laughs> it's going to be quick and succinct and we're going to have a decision uh, let me take a quick read of the rule here. Uh, again, involving possession. So if there's a potential turnover, if the ball touches the ground, or if a player uh, elbow or knee touches the ground, goal line plays, boundary plays, line of scrimmage, uh, if it's third or fourth down, you're trying to get that first down, uh, penalty enforcement. I wonder if that includes pass interference and if they're going to do a better job at enforcing that uh, or actually calling pass interference on those uh spot a foul etc etc so no coaches challenge like the one foot in bounds self-explanatory just like college i like this dedicated ball spotting official and this makes sense instead of nfl you see the nfl players throwing their ball to random officials who have to half the time aren't even paying attention to the ball because they're focused <laughs> on the line of scrimmage no you're gonna throw the ball to the ball spotting official Official has five has uh, five seconds to get the ball going and get a new ball each play as well. So I like that. Oh, wow. Throw the ball out, get the new ball. The ball spotting official is putting the ball right where the spot's supposed to be. Talked about coach to player communication. Offensive players, they're saying select offensive players have coached to helmet. I've heard that it's as many as the entire team or the, uh, the entire offensive team. So there might be some clarification coming on that one. The illegal man downfield, it's a, it's a box of three yards. So 
again, simplified NFL and college have kind of a weird rule. If there's a screen or, you know, depending on seconds that the players can kind of, the offensive line can kind of drift. Then of course, halftime only 10 minutes instead of 20 minutes where uh, you have punt pass and kick cheerleaders and uh, <laughs> all sorts of stuff going on. Just a simple 10 minute break. I mean, do they have time to even go to the locker room? I, I don't know that, to get 53 guys to the locker room usually takes 10 minutes, I would think, unless they're all sprinting there and back. Maybe they'll have a nice huddle on the sideline. Not sure. Weather's, not, not, weather's nice office. in March. Weather's nice in March, so it shouldn't be 120 degrees on the field like it usually is in Tampa in August. Yeah, is there a 50-man roster on this? Great question. I actually don't know the official number of the roster. It kind of went off the NFL, so we do have to look at that to see what the official game roster is but those are your rules and overview in a nutshell we're going to go kind of fly through our next section really quick let's look at the schedule first and we'll hop, then hop to the to the roster Oop, my graphics went a little crazy so let's take a quick look at the schedule still here on the second screen for us uh 10 game schedule of course you'll play your division rivals twice uh and uh, home and away and then uh, uh, alternate with the west conference for, since we're in the east uh first two games are away for the vipers at the guardians and then uh, making a west coast trip to the dragons love that all these games are nationally televised fox abc or espn family and networks Looks like there could potentially be a game on FS1 or FS2, it looks like. Home opener for the Vikings against the Houston Roughnecks on February 27th, Mike? Um, for the 22nd, Roughneck 22nd, game, 22nd, 22nd, 22nd. 22nd. And a home game for your birthday, Emrod. Um, I, that's the game I don't know if I'm going to be here for. I think I'm going to – I think I'll actually be visiting – you that weekend that's right be in texas that weekend so uh, we'll have a live episode with both of us in the same room maybe we'll do that yeah so um so i mean it's not official yet um but if i'm here in town and that doesn't go through i'll definitely be at that game um if um not then we'll be watching it probably there at your house (laughs) um but anyways yeah the only my only complaint is i know they got some mix of saturday and sunday games I'm not a big fan of times. I'm mean, they got some games at two o'clock, some at five. I feel like those are like kind of like odd times. Um, another thing that I kind of like is there's no weekday games. There's not like a like a Monday night game. There's not like a Tuesday, Wednesday night, or Friday night football. Um, you know, I kind of a personally, I'm a big fan of like the, especially you know being here in Tampa. And as any Buccaneers fans know, going to a Buccaneers game um, during the heat at two o'clock or. One o'clock, maybe even five o'clock, depending on the time of the year, is definitely very brutal to be there. So I really enjoyed going to Thursday and Monday night games as a fan. So I kind of wish they had some um, some weekly weekday um, games, which they don't. But maybe that's something that will come in the future um, as the league grows. But hey, it is what it is for now. So yeah, hopefully that maybe that becomes a thing if the XFL becomes popular. Be wonder, you know, Maction kind of takes over Tuesday nights in college football. Uh, we got Thursday night games, Friday night games, so maybe Wednesday nights an opportunity for the XFL as they as they think through kind of taking over midday and and having that nationally televised. If this was the XFL from the year two thousand, given their, uh, their attitude era, they could make it um wacky Wednesday night or something like that. Wacky but... Wednesday, <laughs> WWE Wednesday. So that's the schedule for you guys. Of course, we'll have a show each and every game for the most part uh, right after it uh, within a day or two, and we'll go over each game's action, similar to our Bucking Hangover reaction show for the Vipers. Let's go back. Let's hop. You know, Emrod, let's wrap up tonight looking at our players to watch. And again, we're going to focus on the offense tonight. And just quickly, we wanted to take a look at our coaching staff and maybe you want to uh run through here excited for mark tressman uh did a decent job in the nfl uh you know 
maybe had a bad shake with the Bears and some bad luck, but uh, definitely Coached a couple of years also in um, um, the XFL. Was it the Alouettes or something like that? Or in the CFL? Yeah, he was the CFL coach CFL, up in so Montreal. I, mean... I think you're right. And then a, a few of his team, his uh, coaching staff has some CFL action. As and he's well. also a um, GM as well. So he's also the team's GM, right? Um, as well as head coach. So he's playing um, both roles here. That's uh, great. Man. Yeah. So you'll see our supporting cast of coaches here uh, below. But again, Mark Tressman, a, a big name, and uh, XFL was able to get a, a few big names to be to be coach or yep. have significant roles. Yep, Bob Stoops uh, of Oklahoma fame, uh, able to. Which team is he in, coaching? Is he in... Um, Bob Stoops is Dallas. Dallas, that's right, yeah. That, and then uh, another that's... notable name for um, people from the Florida area, um, Jim Zorn. He's... Um, that's right, Jim Zorn, yes. He's in Seattle. So, Emrod, let's turn it over to you. Lead us through your players to watch. Uh, you did some great work on, on some of this research, and I'm uh, really excited for what you have to share with us. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, yeah, players some watch. Um, we do have, as we all know, our quarterback, which is um, Aaron Murray here. Um, Aaron Murray, he's a local um, quarterback here from Plant High School, which is a school here in Tampa. Had a very successful career there. Went over to University of Georgia, and he actually set some records at the University of Georgia uh, for passing yards um, with 13,166 and with touchdowns through a total of 121 touchdowns there. So, I mean, he had a very good career. Uh, playing in the SEC, and this was a uh, around a team, you know, around a time where SEC. I mean, they've always been a great defensive conference. So he's he's proven some success there. Uh, went on to get drafted by the Kansas City Chiefs in the fifth round. Um, didn't really play much in the NFL um, in college. You know, he did play with some notable players. He actually did play alongside AJ Green, who he had as a receiver for for a time. Was that Todd um, Gurley too, right? Towards yeah, the end of his Todd career. Gurley. Yeah. And he had um, also Isaiah Corral he played with. Mm. Um, so he had some some pretty good um, talent that he played with there. Everyone's um, favorite uh, fantasy uh, f- football court, uh, running back for the uh, Browns. Yeah. Hey, he had a good year a couple of years ago. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, never really made it out or panned out in the NFL. Um, so he went over to the AAF, which that's where I drew some concerns because he did play on the Atlanta Legends. Um, and – for the limited amount of time that he played, I know the league folded early. Uh, I believe the original starting quarterback for that team was Matt Sims. When Aaron Murray came in, he had three touchdowns and seven interceptions. So, um, so his um, interception and inter- uh, touchdown ratio isn't great. That's okay, really- we, Emrod. We've got the board right behind me. Yep. So don't worry. Maybe that's what we got to keep track of now in the XFL is the Aaron Murray uh, interception board. Well, well, we'll bring it in just in case. And if those are not familiar with that board. That is the Jameis Winston interception board. Um, did not think when we got to 20, we were just kind of like, man, we're at 20. This is a big number, but we uh, ended it with 30. So Aaron Murray, do not throw 30 interceptions. Just don't do it. It's only 10 games. Do not average three interceptions a game. <laughs> Please. Oh man. <laughs> Please don't throw more than like 15. Like dude, just don't compete with Winston in that category. Okay. Winston calls you, Talking smack, saying, hey, I'm part of the 30 Dirty Club, the only player ever in that club. You just, just brush it off. It's not a club you want to be part of. Stay away from that club. Um, but, yeah, so, I mean, he's someone we'll, be, we'll have to keep an eye on and we'll have to watch um, to see how he turns it around. Um, and the, based on the projected depth chart, the number one um, receiver for the Vipers is Shantavius Jones who um, played college in Valdosta. He was actually someone who was actually in the AAF on the Atlanta Legends. So he does have some experience playing there with Aaron Murray. Uh, Shantavis Jones is actually the most, not the most, but one of the most targeted wide receivers in the um, AAF. And, you know, he, when the ball got to him and he made the catch, he was able to make some plays. So uh, so hopefully they built, built on that chemistry that they had built about a year ago uh, on the Legends and to carry on here. So that'd be a good connection there to watch. Um, another player that I'm pretty excited about, given like this double forward pass, is um, Quentin Flowers. He was originally drafted as a um, running back, uh, but 
it looks like they moved him over to quarterback on a depth chart um, as a backup. He's someone I can see come in for some wildcat. Um, but I can see them also using him as a um, as a running back for some screen passes or some you know some trick plays and stuff like that. Um, Quinn Flowers does have you know some good speed. The so he's listed as kind of like the third string slash I guess you can say specialty play quarterback. So I think um, Taylor Cornelius is a um, quarterback from Oklahoma State that they um, they drafted in the ninth round. Um, and he's grooming to kind of be like the backup there. But as of right now, I'm on depth chart and for starting, I think Aaron Murray's a clear starter. Um, for running backs, um, our starting running back projected is Devion Smith. He was our he was selected in the third round of the draft there. Um, and he was um, a running back in Michigan. Um, not really a big dominant guy at Michigan um, didn't really have like you know like a big career or anything like that he ended up going undrafted into the NFL um, in 2017 um, he's a little bit bigger guy runs really hard he um, pounds it not a, not a lot of speed he's definitely not a speed guy there so um, so I think they might still use Aaron Murray uh, not Aaron Murray I mean Quentin Flowers in there as a running back, because I mean, me and Quinn Flower just have some some good speed there. So very interesting to see how they actually um, use that. But Davion Smith is a pounder, and you know, hopefully they groomed them and be able to you know get those short yardage plays and maybe even more than that. Um, maybe even more like a Le'Veon, not Le'Veon, but a Garrett Blount possibly. So uh, we'll see how that turns out. But Davion Smith is our projected starting running back. Um, and another guy to watch for here, and the guy that I'm probably the most excited about, is um, Nick Truesdale. He was actually the first. Well, when the um, XFL did their draft, they did their quarterback assignments, and Aaron Murray was assigned to the uh, Tampa Bay uh, Vipers. But when the draft came along, um, our first draft pick ever was um, Nick Truesdale, who we drafted with the fifth pick in the first round. So um, he's look, the more I read about him, he reminds me so much of Darren Waller. I um, mean, his size, he's 6'6, 230 pounds. He is going to be a target monster. Um, he, I can see him being Aaron Murray's a bailout plan there. So that is the guy to watch. And, you know, whoever followed us on our um, other shows or, you know, Moose can say that before the season started, after watching Hard Knocks and seeing like hey, Darren Waller's um, skill set, I said, that is the guy. That's not going to get drafted in fantasy, but he better be on your roster before the season starts because after week one, he will be scooped up, and he was, and um, he had a pretty pretty solid year. Um, but Nick Truesdale, definitely keep an eye on him. I wouldn't be surprised if he possibly even leads the whole XFL in targets, um, let alone the Vipers. Um, he is just he's got some great speed. He can run a 4-4. Four, four, um with that kind of size, I mean, he is a matchup nightmare. So that is the guy that I'm going to say to keep an eye on. He's had some stints in the NFL. He um, did a really good. He tore it up in the AAF when he when he played there, and then he went over to the um, the Jets training camp this past summer. Um, I'm not sure what really happened there, but he's been off and on some teams trying to make some NFL teams. Um, but yeah, that is the guy to keep your eye on. That is that is right going to be our bright spot right there in my opinion. So pretty excited about him if i was let's just say if i was to go buy a uh, xfl vipers jersey right now i think i'll probably roll with nick truesdale i think that's awesome. that's the guy I'm, i would roll with right now yeah i know you've been really excited for him i think the big question that any tampa bay football fan has is what does kicking look like our our kicker is actually andrew franks who um actually you know any Miami Dolphins fans. He played a couple of years there in Miami. I think he finished with a uh, career average um, field goal percentage of like 78%. So um, not great, but at least he has some NFL experience and played for a couple of years in the NFL. So hopefully that, um, that experience transfers over here and he it's closer to 90% on our team. And, you know, being a Tampa Buccaneers fan, as Moose was saying, we've had uh, kicker issues for a pretty <laughs> long time. Um, so yeah, kicker is one of our big. Um, I guess you could say uh, when it comes when we think about offense, when we think about the uh, sore subjects for the Buccaneers, it'd be interceptions and it'd be uh, kicking, because those are 
two things we definitely struggle with. Um, another receiver here lining up as um, part of the first team, a number two receiver is Freddie Martino. He actually had a stint here with the Heavy Buccaneers, um, started a few games with us for the past couple of years. Um, he's moving on there as number two receiver. Um, a guy who's at the, actually a notable name at the bottom of the depth chart, um, there with the 13, Dante Dye. He yeah. played some there with the Buccaneers on the practice squad and actually made some, um, you know, some starts with – not starts, but he definitely played with um, – on the regular team, oh, non-practice squad, the Buccaneers. Well, not a big, didn't do anything big, but you know, at least he played some pro football. So Freddie Martino, and Dante Dyer, two guys that played, you know, NFL receivers. So you know, they're bringing some talent. And you know, playing the NFL, you got to have some decent cap talent. So they were able to bring that. So that's some exciting news there. So I mean, not to get too much into the offensive line. Um, all I know is that um, you know the Vipers, they have a lot of guards. Um, very thin at tackle and center, which kind of concerned me a lot. So they're going to have to probably like cross um, train a lot of these guards to play offensive tackle and center, um, which obviously we know in a hurry. The offensive tackle is very important, protecting the quarterback's blind spot, as we all know, and that's usually protecting them on his left side for a right-handed quarterback like Aaron Murray um, and trying to you know give him some time, which. He's going to need some time, which, you know, the AAF, he definitely did not have a very good offensive line, which, you know, maybe attributed to his interceptions. And also it may have been a, a um, an offensive scheme that he just was not successful in that scheme. So hopefully um, Mark Trestman, you know, more of an offensive-minded coach, is able to, you know, put him in a scheme that, you know, works with his talents and his strengths there. So that's pretty much what I'm going to go with. It's – a lot of question marks on the defensive line, given the lack of um, depth on there in the tackle and center position. Hopefully some of these guys can transition from guard to that position and be successful there. Yeah, just looking at, at our roster, we have an overwhelming number of guards. So I'm hoping that some of these guys are, are ready to step into center just in case. Looks like our projected starting center is uh, Jordan McRae out of UCF. So hopefully he stays healthy. Uh, and gets the job done, but uh, yeah, we have plenty of guards to go around. Uh, man, got a lots of Florida play, uh, Florida natives like Trey Jackson. Uh, it's a name I've heard. Uh, got a, of course, Clint. We talked about Clinton Flowers for running back. Really excited, Terry and Falston, Notre Dame graduate uh, on the team, and uh, you know definitely was a serviceable running back at his time at Notre Dame. So. Nice. Next week, we will preview the defense, go over any XFL news that comes out over the next week, week and a half. Uh, so we'll get ready for episode two, uh, talk about defense, and uh, maybe we'll take a deeper uh, dive into our offensive line because we we know that football is a game of inches and it's about how well you play in the trenches and your defensive and offensive line are more than likely not going to be a big indicator of how good you're going to be. So that is it for our first episode. Hope you enjoyed a little bit on the longer side. We'll make sure to trim these up. Uh, but we were just so excited to talk about everything with the Vipers and the XFL. So hope you enjoyed the, the pretty thorough overview of our offense and the XFL. Don't forget again, uh, hit us up on Twitter at moose underscore TSH for me, the sports moose. And then, of course, for Emrod, at Emrod underscore TSH for him on Twitter. We're really good at responding back. And, of course, make sure to check out the Sports Heap on YouTube. That's our channel. If you'd like to see our pre recorded shows for any of our other shows, as well as we'll have Viper's Nest uploaded by tomorrow evening. And we'll get the podcast going so you can listen to us on the road or at night or off your google or alexa device any anywhere you want to listen to us for the latest viper news it's been your host moose and emrod hope you have a great week we and also s- murder give you five interceptions once you hit five you can put on the board that's right stay off that board that's right want to stay, stay off this board. board once you get to great once we get to five, five you're getting on the board and we're keeping count have a great night we'll see you for the next episode of the viper's nest Take care. Good night.